Om Sahana Babatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavai Tejasvina Vaditamastu Mavidrashavahai Om Shanti 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 Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace and blessed beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. <clears throat> well, good evening and namaste. Welcome to our Wednesday evening class where we study the art of spirituality as taught to us by Lord Krishna, Sri Krishna. We're studying Bhagavad Gita, discussing what uh, Sri Krishna tells Arjuna in the course of these verses that uh, are offered to us uh, from these many thousands of years ago, but given to us in fresh, understandable modern English by Swami Prabhavananda and Christopher Isherwood. So, uh, there's only just the four of us so far, but I'm still going to ask, is there anything left over from last week that wants uh, clarification or you have a question or you have a comment from your own wisdom or experience about anything that Krishna uh, was saying to Arjuna or anything that Arjuna was asking of Sri Krishna. All right, well, Swayam, we're not, we, the decision was made a while back. We're not going to wait on people. If they come uh, en retard, as the French say, uh, <coughs> then so be it. So let us just proceed. Okay. So last week we finished the chapter uh, on Karma Yoga. Um, so we are now beginning chapter four renunciation through knowledge and it is i think page uh, 57 uh, in in this edition of the book swami prabhavananda's translation renunciation through knowledge shri krishna saying four Consumer, F-O-E, foe, dash consumer. Now I have shown you yoga that leads to the truth undying. I taught this yoga first to Vivaswat. Vivaswat taught it in turn to Manu. Next, Ikshvaku learnt it from Manu. And so the sages in royal succession carried it onward from teacher to teacher till at length it was lost throughout ages forgotten. Arjuna asks, Vivaswat was born long before you. How am, how am I to believe that you were the first to teach this yoga? Sri Krishna replies, You and I, Arjuna, have lived many lives. I remember them all. You do not remember. I am the birthless, the deathless, Lord of all that breathes. <coughs> I seem to be born. It is only seeming, only my Maya. And then there is an asterisk there. Um, but there are two asterisks, so let me read on. Um, it is only seeming, 
only my maya. I am still master of my prakriti, the power that makes me. And the two asterisks, the two words are interchangeable. That's maya and prakriti. They both refer to the creative power of Brahman and hence <clears throat> to the basic stuff of which the universe is made. When goodness grows weak, when evil increases, I make myself a body. In every age I come back to deliver the holy, to destroy the sin of the sinner, to establish righteousness. He who knows the nature of my task and my holy birth is not reborn when he leaves this body. He comes to okay, hold, hold on. Uh, the uh, when Sri Krishna says, "I am it," I only seem to be born. It is only seeming. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that he doesn't exist within time, space, and causation, and can still be known to us. Uh, if that's what we wish, because it is through the power of devotion and love that these forms take uh, their embodied uh, being. But as Swami Vivekananda said of Sri Krishna, this is the seeming, the Maya, the Prakriti that we just read about. Swami Vivekananda said of Sri Krishna, he is but mother's shadow. Mother is Prakriti itself, untransformed. <coughs> and uh, her tools are Maya and, and the Gunas. Uh, so this, there is a complete inseparability, uh, just as there is between Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother, there's a complete inseparability between Prakriti, the Divine Mother, as spoken of by Swami Vivekananda, and Sri Krishna. They are one and the same being uh, that takes, um, Mother takes this form, creates this shadow of herself in order to do, and please read again then, what it is that, uh, that, uh, Sri Krishna comes to do in every age. Please read that paragraph again, dear. Swayam? We're not hearing you, dear. Sorry, sorry. I muted myself when you were talking. When goodness grows weak, when evil increases, I make myself a body. In every age I come back to deliver the holy, to destroy the sin of the sinner, to establish righteousness. He who knows the nature of my task and my holy birth is not reborn when he leaves the body. He comes to me. Let's, let's meditate for a moment. Let's reflect for a moment on destroy the sin of the sinner. What this means is that Sri Krishna or mother has the ability to simply wipe clean the slate of your karma. Now, as Holy Mother said, it doesn't mean that nothing will happen, but if something very serious were to happen, well, she uses the example of a sword blow that would cut off your leg, something must happen but it will be a scratch. You will receive a scratch. Why? Because you have understood what Sri Krishna just said, the nature of his being and his task. And uh, what he means by, I come in every age to do these things. If we have faith in these things through experience, not through blind faith, not through uh, 
just believing it because we've heard it, <clears throat> but feeling it in our prayer, contemplation, concentration, and meditation, then we will come to understand what Sri Krishna means when he says, why I'm born and the nature of my task. And so, because you have no more karmas of any significance, then you do not have to take rebirth. So I'm going to ask you, Swayam, to read that whole uh, thing again. With all of that in mind, we can hear it in that in that frame of reference. Um, you, should I read all of Sri Krishna's? From well, the... from where he says, "In every age, I come back." That that okay. starting from there. Okay, in every age, I come back to deliver the holy, to destroy the sin of the sinner, to establish righteousness. He who knows the nature of my task and my holy birth is not reborn when he leaves this body. <coughs> he comes to me, flying from fear, from lust and anger, he hides in me. His refuge his safety. Burn clean in the blaze of my being. In me, many find home. Whatever wish men bring me in worship, that wish I grant them. Whatever path men travel is my path. No matter where they walk, it leads to me. The poetry part is over. Now the Swamiji's um, words. Most men worship the gods because they want success in their worldly undertakings. This kind of material success can be gained very quickly here on earth. I established the four castes which correspond to the different types of guna and karma. I am their author. Nevertheless, you must realize that I am beyond action and changeless. Action does not contaminate me. I have no desire at all for the fruits of action. A man who understands my nature in this respect will never become the slave of his own activity. Because they understood this, the ancient seekers for liberation could safely engage in action. You too must do your work in the spirit of those early seers. What is action? What is inaction? Even the wise are puzzled by this question. Therefore, I will tell you what action is. When you know that, you will be free from all impurity. You must learn what kind of work to do, what kind of work to avoid, and how to reach a state of calm detachment from your work. The real nature of action is hard to understand. He who sees the inaction that is in action and the action that is in inaction is wise indeed. Even when he is engaged in action, he remains poised in the tranquility of the Atman. Now, there is the great secret behind all of this. If we practice meditation. It's not a compulsion of karma yoga. He's still talking about karma yoga here. <clears throat> it's not a compulsion, but it certainly is auspicious because it is through this act of meditation, of practicing meditation, that we gain insight into the fact that the Atman 
is the core and source of our being. Atman, of course, is not separate from Brahman. It's just a way of talking about it as it exists within us. But when we sit quietly, as he said, and we become calm, then we begin to sense this witness awareness, which is the face of the Atman, as it presents itself to our waking and, and uh, yogic awareness. <clears throat> yoga nidra, yoga sleep, that's why, just making a distinction. As we sink deep into meditation, uh, we practice something that is called yoga nidra, yoga sleep. It appears as if we're asleep, but we are not asleep. We are fully awake in the awareness of our interior realm. So this is what he means here. Is there any comment or concern or question from any of you about what Sri Krishna is discussing and saying? Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. So contemplating that um, ultimately um, it is the gunas uh, which are um, responsible for action. All action. Uh, so, um, and then thereby um, doing action with a detachment. So that's uh, having inaction in action. Yes. Uh, so the, the other one, which is um, action in inaction, that again is, could you um, sort of um, expand that a little bit? How can we see action in inaction? Well, when we, when we are practicing meditation, it appears that we're inactive. But in fact, we are very active internally. We're very active. As a matter of fact, we're more alive than we are when we are in our uh, ordinary awareness waking state. We're, we're more alive, we feel more alive, though we do not have a sensation of the body. And ultimately then, we don't have a sensation of the mind either. We have an awareness of this Atman. This witness awareness, saguna atman, and so we're very active. And that saguna atman, the reason it said saguna, is that it is with the. It has uh, actions. It, it is as saguna atman has nirguna atman nothing, no change, no. Uh, it's infinite, eternal, and changeless. But as it appears within time, space, and causation, as Saguna Atman, it does indeed have intentions and has experiences. And because it experiences our actions, it sanctions them. Both our actions in the external world and our actions much more profoundly in the interior world. And when we begin to feel that intensely, when we begin to feel that intensely, then we are in the state that he says uh, will not be reborn simply because there's nothing for us to be reborn for. We're detached from all that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you, Brother Shantan. Anything else from anyone? Either of the, uh, any of you who's with us now? All right, dears, please, uh, let's read on. Um. Now again the poetry begins. The seers say truly 
that he is wise who acts without lust or scheming for the fruit of the act. His act falls from him. Its chain is broken, melted in the flame of my knowledge. Turning his face from the fruit, he needs nothing. The Atman is enough. He acts and is beyond action. Not hoping, not lusting. Bridling the body and mind. He calls nothing his own. Bridling. Bridling right. is what we, what we do to a, 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 a horse or other animal of, uh, that we are going, but particularly horses. Uh, we bridle them so that they can be controlled. And so this is what he means, you know, putting a bridle in the mouth, so to speak, of the, uh, of the mind and of the, of the senses. So please read that again, dear, just so we know. Even for those of us who didn't know what bridling meant. Not hoping, not lusting, bridling body and mind. He calls nothing his own. He acts and earns no evil. What God's will gives, he takes and is contented. Pain follows pleasure. He's not troubled. Gain follows loss. He is indifferent. Of whom should he be jealous? He acts and is not bound by his action. <coughs> when the bond so what, of... what is what Sri Krishna is saying is you're not generating new karma. When you're when you're behaving in this way, you're not generating new karma. He acts and is beyond action. He earns no evil. There is no, you're not accruing any new karma when you act and serve in this spirit. Is everyone clear about that? How very important this is and why Sri Krishna says even a little practice of this yoga frees you from the terrible wheel of rebirth and death. Because even a little practice of this yoga, if you practice a little, he gets behind it and makes it work. <clears throat> so even a little practice of this yoga frees you from the terrible wheel of rebirth and death. It is this generation of new karmas that, and that are representative of desires and, and attachments and aversions and all the things that bind us to this time, space and causation realm. So is all that clear to everyone? Is there any, anything at all that anyone would like to say? Actually, or, yes, Glenn. Question, brother. So all the motivation has to come from the gunas, is that correct? Everything that happens everything that occurs but so, the motivation is not your own the motivation actually the volition comes from the divine being it represents itself as the gunas because those are the instruments to make things happen but the volition or whatever word you used i've now lost it uh, your intention is is not your own. Does that address it, Glenn? Yeah, I was just kind of trying to get my mind around more where the motivation and the volition come from. I know it's coming, um, you know, from God, but I'm <clears throat> not exactly understanding this to how. Well, this 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 is what Sri Ramakrishna describes. It, how he describes it. He says this, the, the, I said it is these, this volition comes from the divine being. The divine being that is responsible, so to speak, 
for all of time, space and, space and causation, all of Maya is mother. Mother is understood to be the author of all volition, all intentionality, all anything that we can experience, even the highest, even the highest. And so Sri Ramakrishna describes this as mother's Leela, her play. This is where these intentions come from. And they're not necessarily uh, coherent. They're not necessarily uh, continuous in the sense of uh, one thing leads to another. They're much more, the way it's described by Sri Ramakrishna is much more like the world of quantum mechanics than it is uh, and he says mother is capricious. So volition is mother's gift and her burden. Because as long as we feel like we must act and are not acting in the way that Sri Krishna describes here, then we regenerate new karmas and we're bound to this uh, realm of time, space, and causation. Is that any clarification at all, Glenn? Yeah, I'm just, you know, thinking about, so this person at this point realizes they're not driving the bus. They're just have this volition that just comes. Well, what did you say about dancing? What did you say to me? Dancing with the master, for the master, as the master. Precisely. For the master, with the master, as the master. Or, if you wish, the mother. <clears throat> Dancing for the mother, with the mother, as the mother. She is that which creates you. She is Nirguna Atman as well as Saguna Atman. Brahman and Shakti, or the Divine Mother, are not separate. They are just one thing in two forms. Just as Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother were one being in two forms. One thing, if you will, in two forms. Sri Ramakrishna described it as water still, water and waves, same water. So the volition is comes from the divine being, that volition to dance, dance. When I experience that, it, it doesn't feel like it's my own volition. I'm just sure. riding the bus. Well, that, exactly. You're just you're just being the dancer that dances for, with, and as the divine being. Certainly, we're not driving the bus. If we think we're driving the bus, mm, my goodness, we're, we're certainly in a, in a very delicate situation at that point. Sometimes I do think I'm driving the bus. <laughs> well, we all think that. We all fall into that. Uh, frame of mind. My hands just go right for the steering wheel. Yeah. It ain't necessarily so, as the song says. It ain't necessarily so. Anything else from anyone? Thank you, Glenn. Um, first, on a lighter note, um, so there is Tesla and other cars now to teach us that we are not the driver. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on a, uh, my question is, um, these four um, sentences or these four uh, places in the poem, pain follows pleasure, he is not troubled. Gain follows loss, he is indifferent. So um, is it correct to say that, I mean, as long as we are embodied and have not reached the state, 
we are going to feel both pain and joy of uh, pain of loss and joy of gain i guess it, it so is can not, we say it, it is not that the enlumined soul does not feel these things what are the words that he uses troubled and indifferent untroubled he is not troubled he is not troubled so pain follows pleasure he is not troubled it doesn't mean that the pain and the pleasure aren't experienced they are experienced gain follows loss he is indifferent it's 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 not as if these things ever go away as long as we are embodied. Adi Shankaracharya is very explicit about this in the last two chapters of Viveka Judamani. That as long as even if you are fully illumined, but you remain embodied, the results of Parabdha karma will be experienced. But the illumined soul can turn this all to bright karma by the, by the glow of their being. They turn it all to bright karma, and it isn't bright karma for them. They offer that bright karma to individual beings for their, for their upliftment, and to humanity for the overall upliftment. This is what Adi Shankaracharya says, and it's said elsewhere in the Upanishads as well. Um, the word indifferent, it has sort of a negative connotation, meaning don't care kind of attitude. Um, that's, but one it way mean to, that's one way to think about it, Swayam. I mean, it doesn't that is not its connotation, that's its denotation. Mm. <clears throat> to be indifferent means that you simply don't pay attention. Okay. You ignore. To be indifferent is to ignore. And it isn't that you even have to do it volitionally. It's simply, you, you simply don't register it in the way you did when you were reactive you become unreactive mm -hmm. indifferent or you ignore it. this is this is the way of the jnani mm -hmm. they actively ignore things when things you're not identifying it as yourself yeah it's not as yourself and it has nothing to do with you It's one of the great lessons taught by Don Juan Matus to Carlos Castaneda. Stop involving yourself with all these things. Participate in not doing. And all these things will come and happen. And you will witness them. But they are of no concern what do you what do you whatsoever. Because you simply don't have time for any of that. If you take up your time with it, then you'll just keep on taking up your time with it. <clears throat> Does that make it clear, Swayam? Yes. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? Always think of the burning monk. The You mean the Vietnamese monk? Yeah, in Cambodia in 1963 at the embassy. Was it Cambodia? I thought it was Vietnam, but never uh, yeah, well, my understanding was is it was in front of the Cambodian embassy to draw media attention to what was going on leading up to the Vietnam. Right, right, right. Uh, in any event, the Burning Monk, yes. But that's an incredible example of not self. Yes, of not. Uh, and don't believe, don't think for a moment he didn't experience the pain of burning to death. Brother, sometimes um, 
we feel so, or rather I feel so inadequate and hopeless that um, it almost feels like uh, praying to the mother, this is all hopeless, just burn it if it's not adequate enough for you. Just, just burn it if it's not. Uh... Rajiv, this feeling of inadequacy and hopelessness is made of two things. It's a, a, a early training where we were educated to think of ourselves in that way and by, by people sharing their misery with us. And it's also a product of tamas. When we feel tamasic, extremely tamasic, which we will feel, the gunas come and go. So do not take it seriously. Do not think that there's something wrong with you because you're feeling this way. You were educated to it as a child by people sharing their own hopelessness and feelings of inadequacy. However subtly it may have been, it's there, believe me. <clears throat> because they, these adults do have that feeling. And then these, these samskaras, these mental impressions that are left with you and they may not even have been fully formed in this lifetime we're told they may also be carryovers from in our latent subconscious uh, from prior lifetimes but then along comes the guna of tamas and stimulates those mental impressions or some scars and then we feel them and when we feel them, it seems like a reality. It seems like that's how it is. And this is where we have to be, as this verse just said, indifferent. Example from this life experience. Around 2007, 2008, somewhere in there, I was coming every morning to the Hollywood temple for morning meditation. Oftentimes it was really wonderful. For a period of time it was anything but. I just had these feelings that you're talking about and my attempts at practicing contemplation, concentration and meditation led me to this phrase mud mind. I had mud mind. It was as if I were trying to slog through a swamp, a mire filled swamp, how hard it was to put one foot in front of the other. So I told Swami Sarvadevananda about it. And Swami Sarvadevananda said, pay no attention to it which is the same way as saying be indifferent to it. It's just, it was his way of saying, pay no attention to it, ignore it, be indifferent to it, it will pass. Just keep doing your practice in spite of your feelings. And so I followed his advice and within, I don't remember really how long, a matter of a couple of weeks at the most, it did indeed pass. And I was able to understand then when I read Swami Vivekananda's book, Christ the Messenger, about how life occurs in waveforms. We go into troughs where everything seems dark and as you say, hopeless and uh, you don't feel adequate to anything. And then th that's then that's the influence of tamas and the negative aspects of rajas. Then we rise up the wave. There's no, if there's a trough in the ocean waves, there is also a rising wave. And so we are lifted up by that rising wave which is the influence, the positive influence of rajas and sattva. 
<clears throat> and so we feel transcendent. We feel more than adequate. We don't even think about adequacy as, as a concern. We're simply reveling, as they say, in the self. So, Rajiv, if you can manage to be indifferent toward it, it will pass. This is not just the promise from me. This is the promise of the eternal teacher. Does any of that make sense? Yes, brother. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Yes. Thank you for the words of encouragement. And, and believe you me, Rajiv, you are worthy. You are adequate. You are success. You are a successful person. Does that mean that's all that happens in your life? Of course not. It's not even true of the avatars. <clears throat> because we live in this world of time, space, and causation, which is eternally changing and is finite. So be of good cheer, Raji. You're doing well. The fact Thank that you, you're here tonight, the fact that you're here tonight is proof positive that you're reaching in the right direction. Anything else from anyone about any of that? All right, Swayam, please read the few lines. And by the way, Swayam, there's no difference between the poetry as presented in Swami Prabhupada's Gita and the prose, except style. Uh, he and Isherwood decided that some of what Sri Krishna said deserve poetic presentation. Others of it would be more understandable if presented in modern intelligible prose. So it isn't as if it's the Swami speaking when it goes to prose, right. Krishna speaking when it is, it's it's the Swami's interpretation of what Sri Krishna said. And as is said in the translator's preface, they did this completely arbitrarily, the two of them deciding these passages need this poetic presentation, the, the short lines, the, the way poetry delivers its message to us, and others of it deserve this prose presentation that allows us to allows us as interpreters and presenters, Prabhupada and Isherwood, to be more narrative in their presentation. So that's the only difference in the poetry and the and the uh, more narrative or prose sections. They're not, it's all what the, the best a presentation that the Swami and Isherwood could make of what Sri Krishna was saying. Thank you for that clarification. I sort of realized it as soon as I said it and started reading, but thank you. That um, is um, very clear now. Okay, very good, dear. Okay, read into what you do, what, read into what comes next. Okay. Um, going back, what God's will gives he takes and is contented. Pain follows pleasure, he is not troubled. Gain follows loss, he is indifferent. Of whom should he be jealous? He acts and is not bound by his action. When the bonds are broken, his illumined heart beats in Brahman. His every action is worship of Brahman. Can such acts bring evil? Brahman is the ritual. Brahman is the offering. Brahman is he who offers to the fire that is Brahman. 
If a man sees Brahman in every action, he will find Brahman. And that is what we're so familiar with, as is said as a prayer of offering uh, and recognition, particularly for food, but it can be for any uh, anything. Om Brahma Arpanam, Brahma Havir, Brahma Agno, Brahma Uttam, Brahma Evate Nagantavyam, Brahma Karma Samadina. That's the Sanskrit of this most, perhaps most famous verse from the Gita. We're all familiar with it. Most people who even chant it aren't all that clear where it comes from and the context in which it's presented. <clears throat> so this is when the heart is engaged. So read what the English says again, Swayam. Sure. Brahman is the ritual. Brahman is the offering. Brahman is he who offers to the fire that is Brahman. If a man sees Brahman in every action, he will find Brahman. In other words, Brahman is all there is. Brahman is the ritual, the, 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 what is being offered by the ritual, the person who does the offering, the fire into which it is offered, which of course in food is the digestive fire of our hydrochloric acid. Uh, and he who sees Brahman in every action attains to Brahman. One, not, this has nothing to do with gender. So one who sees Brahman in every action attains to Brahman. One who sees Brahman in every action. This is absolutely unqualified and unconditional. Is there any comment or concern or question about what Sri Krishna has just said? All right, dear, please read it again and then read on. Brahman is the ritual. Brahman is the offering. Brahman is he who offers to the fire that is Brahman. If a man sees Brahman in every action, he will find Brahman. Some yogis merely worship the devas. Others are able, by the grace of Atman, to meditate on the identity of the Atman <coughs> with Brahman. For these, the Atman is the offering, and Brahman, the sacrificial fire into which it is offered. <laughs> Some withdraw all their senses from contact with exterior sense objects. For these, hearing and other senses are the offering. Self-discipline, the sacrificial fire. Others allow their minds and senses to wander unchecked and try to see Brahman within all exterior sense objects. For these, sound and other sense objects are the offering and the sense enjoyment the sacrificial fire. Some renounce all the actions of the senses and all the functions of the vital force. For these, such actions and function are the offering, and the practice of self-control is the sacrificial fire, kindled by the knowledge of Atman. Then there are others whose way of worship is to renounce sense objects and material possessions. Others set themselves austerities and spiritual disciplines. That is their way of worship. Others worship through the practice of Raja Yoga. 
others who are earnest seekers for perfection and men of strict vows study and meditate on the truths of the scriptures that is their way of worship others are intent on controlling the vital energy so they practice breathing exercises inhalation exhalation and stoppage of breath others mortify their flesh by fasting to weaken their sensual desires and thus achieve self control all these understand the meaning of sacrificial worship through worship their sins are consumed away they eat the food which has been blessed in the sacrifice thus they obtain immortality and reach eternal brahman he who does not worship god cannot be happy even in this world what then can he expect from any other all these and many other forms of worship are prescribed by the scriptures all of them involve the doing of some kind of action when you fully understand this you will be made free in brahman okay let's let's just pause here is one of those catalog passages that occurs in all of the scriptural traditions most particularly in the upanishads and therefore also in the gita which is said to be the cream of the Upanishads. This is a fairly exhaustive listing and discussion by Sri Krishna of the various ways in which people use their mind and senses and other attributes to worship. And it is, you can, if you are thoughtful, you'll find yourself in there somewhere. And they're not a perfect match, of course, there never is. Those words, but you'll find that your way of being with whatever it is you conceive of as the divine presence matches more or less one of those ways of worship. And of course, we can see very clearly uh, some of the yogas uh, those who uh, let their senses wander unchecked, uh, and so on. This is the bhakti yoga, a bhakti. This is how, how a bhakta practices. It isn't that they don't do anything, but they don't try to control what comes to them, and they don't reject anything, which is what Sri Ramakrishna prescribes as most opportune and most auspicious for this time. <clears throat> Any of you who want to discuss that privately, I'll be glad to discuss that with you. What Sri Ramakrishna recommends and how bhakti yoga is the path that he prescribes for this time and place in the history of the spiritual unfoldment of the Divine Mother, which shows up as these various uh, yugas or ages of the world. Any comments or questions from anyone? Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. So, um, like you said, it's a, it's a good little uh, list to go through and reflect on to see uh, where each one is and um, uh, like most others i think i fall into this category of allowing the mind and senses to wander unchecked and trying to see the brahman within all exterior sense objects so when he says try to see the brahman that's almost i mean exactly what we are trying to do uh, right i mean I'm not seeing the Brahman, but I try to see the Brahman. 
Well, exactly. Brahman, Brahman cannot be seen right. except as Saguna Atman right. or as Shakti, as Mother herself. As Sri Ramakrishna says, Brahman and Shakti are not different. They're just that water still, water and waves. So we can see the Saguna Atman, which is this witness face of our source, the, the source of our being. We can see that clearly if we practice contemplation, concentration and meditation. We come to a very clear understanding <clears throat> that there is this witness awareness within us and it does not change. No matter how often we go away and come back, everything around us, everything within us, except that seems to change. That does not change. And what we experience when we do experience it is a great calmness and a great interior silence. This is what's pointed to when uh, in, in that Oma Satoma Satkama. Lead us from this realm of endless noise and relentless uh, uh, deception to thine abode of silence, serenity, clarity, and peace. The, the realm of the Atman, the Saguna Atman, is that realm of silence, serenity, clarity, and peace. And it is accessible to each and every one of us if we practice. And our practice will occasionally, as Rajiv pointed out, be interrupted by these periods of feeling hopeless and inadequate and it's darkness, we're surrounded by darkness, and what in the world is the point anyway? And all of these thoughts and feelings arise. As, as Swami Sarvadevananda said to me, pay no attention to it. Simply acknowledge that it's there, that that's the reality as you are experiencing it in your waking awareness right now, and go on with your spiritual practices. If you do that, you will find that that uh, evaporates, that it disappears and is replaced by something else. And then that's replaced by something else and something else and something else. As the Buddha said, stop thinking about the past. You are not the person that you were a moment ago. Any comments, concerns, or questions before we wind up this evening? All right, dear. As always, so glad that we gather together this way, that we do indeed study the art of spirituality together, and we can celebrate one another and love one another for this effort, for this uh, being together and joining together in this way. And so this poem called Flower Offering. O oh, dearly beloved, O oh, dearly beloved Lord, a flower at your feet for each one who comes to your open door, a flower at your feet for each one who stands by your open door and says, come to me, come to me, offering to break this world's chain that binds us down to ignorance, suffering, and death. A flower at your feet for each one who takes the path that you have struck through this, your jungle world. Om Amen. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace and blessed beneficence be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. 
Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai, Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe, may we be healthy, may we be cheerful, may we have peace of mind, and may we know we are always in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father no matter how it may seem at any given moment, that we are told by all of the great teachers, all of the avatars, all of these who are the eternal teacher in human form, they each tell us that is the truth. You are always in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as your mother and father, even though there may be pain and pleasure, gain and loss, all these things, success and failure. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai. Any final thought from anyone? All right, our next opportunity to be together, of course, will be on Saturday when we'll study Patanjali's Yoga Sutras again as pres presented to us by Swami Prabhavananda and Christopher Isherwood um, in their book, How to Know God. And uh, it, it's a very powerful presentation of a workbook devised by Patanjali, to achieve the unlimited and unconditioned state which Patanjali calls Kaivalya. Independence, independence of all limitation and condition. And then on Sunday, we'll discuss the, some teachings of Lord Jesus Christ in the context of Raja Yoga. And the, the, uh, some of you will recognize this reference. The title of this coming Sunday's discussion is Cast the First Stone. Anything from anyone? All right, dears. Thank you, Brother Shankar. Until I hear from you personally, or until we gather on Saturday. Uh, and any of you who wish to come and visit, uh, please know that you're most welcome. You just have to give me a call or send me an email, and we'll arrange a mutually convenient time. All right. Let's see. Godspeed, everyone.